Y'all look so tame, though. Yeah. Y'all? <laughs> you mean Rose? <laughs> Rose. <laughs> Oh, son. Yeah. <laughs> you said you're going out to eat? Yeah, it's Where? just, I have nothing for Joel. Because we just got home and she and Mike, I have nothing for him. So I was like, you get to be <laughs> I have stuff, like I have a gift for him. to be here. This is good. I'm sure others have got family get-togethers and fun stuff going. Uh, let me share a verse that encourages my heart, and I hope it will yours. Whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for their children it will be a refuge. That is a blessing and an encouragement to me. I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here and to see you at this time. Thank you for being here. Good morning, folks. Um, just, uh, it's good to be um, so here celebrating with you Father's Day. And I uh, just want to say a happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Um, we are just so privileged to share in, in this faith and uh, what we believe and what we are sure of uh, with our children, but also to have uh, had the privilege to have grown up under uh, the discipleship and discipline of a godly father as well. Not everybody has that opportunity. Um, and uh, so just, I'm very thankful for my dad, and I know many of you have experienced the same brothers that don't have a father who, who um, knew the Lord or has, is you know following the Lord. Like it's, it is, it is, Hard and is an opportunity though to share the word with them, to encourage them. Um, but what a privilege to have, to have a father who loves us beyond what a earthly father could, beyond any of our <laughs> uh, eccentricities and mistakes and sins. He chooses to love us and he chose to die for us on the cross for our sins. What a privilege it is, what a joy it is to celebrate and have the love of that kind of a father. So happy Father's Day to you guys. I um, want to share a few prayer requests and, and, uh, and also from our, our missionary of the week. I don't have a, a regular update from Dan and Deb, 
uh, but continue to pray with them and their, for their ministries in uh, Germany, um, for their ministries with uh, the, the several of the different churches that they're working with there. Um, so remember them in, in prayer throughout the week. Pray for our, continue to pray for our pastoral search process. Um, continue to pray for those who are struggling with health issues and those, especially those who can't be with us that we don't see very often. Uh, we think of like Wendell and um, we think of, of uh, a few others that, that just aren't able to make it very, very often. So continue to lift each other up in prayer. Um, and, and one announcement here, the refreshed ladies night will be on June 17th uh, from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. Uh, is there a location yet for this? Refresh? Yeah. Nice. Okay, and it will be at, at, uh, at Emily's house. So June 17th, 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. That is tomorrow. Yeah, I know, man, I have flies. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are so grateful to be here today. Father, thankful for, for your love for us. Thank you, Father, for the example that you that we find in, in, for our life, Lord, as, as, as believers, as your children. Uh, for me, particularly, Lord, as a father, to, to see your love reflected in how I love my children and how I love my wife and my family, Lord. Lord, thank you for giving us these, this pathway, these instructions and the example that you have. Uh, Lord, we are so grateful for, for the love of, of a father. Thank, thankful, Father, for uh, my father and for those who, would have, who have had fatherly influence in my life. There are many here in this church, uh, Lord, many that, that um, I'm just very grateful for and burdened for, Lord. And, uh, and I pray, Lord, that you would uh, be encouraging and, and touching their hearts, Lord, and challenging them. Father, I pray for Dan and Deb and uh, their ministries in Germany. I pray, Lord, as they minister today to those around them. Uh, and the, the, the churches that they're involved in, Lord, that you would be uh, blessing uh, their ministry, Lord, and, and that they would be seeing the fruit of, of the ministry. Uh, I pray, Lord, that you keep them in, in health and, and uh, encourage, Lord, in, uh, in their ministries throughout this week. Father, so grateful for uh, our, our, the people who have made it today, Lord, but we remember those who can't and those who are struggling with health. We pray for, for Wendell, uh, Lord, uh, at home. We pray that you would be encouraged and we pray for his health as well. Lord, we pray for Daryl and, uh, and, and his continued recovery, for, for Chuck and for Neil, for Amy Smith, Lord, and uh, Lord, for, for many of the, those who are just struggling with different health situations, we pray for health and strength for them. And, uh, Lord, we pray for those requests that just uh, are a burden on someone's heart that we just uh, don't know about, uh, can't be shared necessarily, but Lord, we pray for those requests that may seem impossible and burdensome. We pray that they would be laid at your feet Lord, we know that you will work through them uh, in those situations, Lord. Uh, Lord, we are so thankful for your, your graciousness, uh, Lord, in the difficulties of life. We're so thankful for this time of worship and prayer. Thankful for the time of the scripture being shared. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning, everybody. It is good to see you here this morning. <clears throat> it is great to be able to set this day aside to honor fathers. So to all the fathers here, happy Father's Day, guys. Um, this day can be uh, a great day for some. As Joel mentioned, it can be sometimes hard for some. Because um, as Joel said, I'm very thankful that I have a father-in-law and a father who are godly men, who I have as a good example. And they have taught me and they continue to teach me. And I continue to learn. And I'm thankful for that opportunity. Each of us has, if we trusted Christ as our Savior, the perfect father. Because I know this is going to be a shock to you, but neither of my fathers, father-in-law or father, are perfect. Amen. Yeah. It's, I know that's, that's just blows some of your mind, but our Heavenly Father is perfect. He is holy. He is unchanging. He is always the same, which is a great thing. He is immutable. That's unchanging. He will never, ever fail. He will always be totally just, totally holy, totally loving. He is the perfect example for us. And he has set forth for us his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life and be saved from our heavenly father's wrath. Because prior to us trusting Christ, we couldn't call him father. But now... Not only can we call him Father, but we can call him Abba, which to a Hebrew child is Daddy. 
how precious it is to be able to worship our Heavenly Father each and every Sunday. Amen? Amen. Let's stand and sing together. He is exalted. remind us of all that he has done for us. Everything that we do, everything that we can accomplish is all because of our God's grace.
is important that we recognize that it is through the power of God, through the grace of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, and because of Christ's shed blood, that we can accomplish anything. And it's all for our Heavenly Father's glory and honor and praise. Are you glad that you can be involved in that this morning? I hope that you are. And I hope that you're glad that you can be involved, that you are involved in giving back to the Lord. This is a time of joy for us to, to be thankful for what we can accomplish because God has enabled us. And again, it's for his honor and glory. David Hernandez, would you please lead us in prayer this morning during this time? Lord, praise be to you. You are the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. While at times we, depending on where we were in life, may not have wanted you as a father, but you have always been the father we needed. I just pray that you would uh, continue to guide us in the way we should go. This is my prayer. Amen. Amen. I did because it's a good reminder isn't it that my worth is not in what I own sometimes if that's what we think if that's what we take our identity from well if we take our identity from the 
anything before Christ. That's a problem, amen? amen. We amen. need to be reminded of that, that our worth is in Christ. That is who we identify. And this month, it's important to remember that. And the, because there are so many people that take their identity in sin. But we, as believers, those who have trusted Christ as our Savior, can take our identity from Christ and in Him alone. Thank you as well for singing that song with us and reminding ourselves of that. We're going to dismiss our kids at Children's Church. They're all looking at me like, can we go? Can we go? Yes, you can go and have a great time with your teachers learning about things of the Lord. We are going to again sing a song that helps us to remember that we must be open to hearing from the Lord. It's not because of our own wisdom. It's because of the Holy Spirit that gives us understanding. And if you are here this morning and you've trusted Christ as your Savior, then you are not blinded. You can understand the things of God because the Holy Spirit will give you understanding. So let's sing this song. It's a prayer. Speak, O Lord as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word, and as we think and pray for our pastor as he delivers those words that God has prepared for him today. pray that these gifts that we have given to you both with our voices from our hearts the money that you have entrusted to us as we have given back to you we pray that you are pleased with our offerings this morning father and now 
And we give as we continue to praise you and thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for our pastor who is prepared to share from your word. Prepare our hearts. Prepare him. Keep him uh, behind the cross. Help him to share the word that you would have us to hear. And may we do so again for your honor and glory. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. For those of you that no longer have a dad on this earth, that doesn't stop us from being a father and being a father to others and being thankful, oh, so thankful for the privilege of impacting. There's a saying that I found, it says there is more needed than being godly fathers. So many people who are in churches because they go to church, maybe even drop a coin in the offering, they consider themselves a godly man, a godly father. But it's just not that way. There is more required, guys, to be the kind of father that God would have us to be. Now, sadly, according to a recent uh, survey by the U.S. Census, 18.4 million kids, that's more than one in four, do not live with a biological stepfather or adoptive father or any kind of a father in their home. One in four. And guys, it's not just those that are, um, what do I want to say? Those that are, I just lost everything right here. What a blessing. Everything disappeared. I'm not going to cry out for Dave. I'm going to be looking on this myself. It's not just for those that are low in income or those that live in poverty or those that are struggling in different ways in their home and in their family. It's just not that way. In fact, the Bible tells us that many of the men that are absentee fathers have jobs. They're men that live at home, but they are absentee in the way that they work with their children, encourage their children, watch over their children, sadly. According to the census, children in these kind of homes are affected in the following ways. First of all, they are four times greater risk of being in poverty or carrying that along to, the, to their family. They are two times greater at risk of infant mortality. Of those children, many of them are more likely to go to prison and more likely to have behavioral problems. Probably Wendy with her kind of teaching, would be able to back me up on this. Those that do not have a significant father in the home, they are seven times more likely for the girls to become pregnant as a teen. Two times more likely to drop out of school. And frankly, the list goes on and on. There's a tremendous reason for hope, though, in rooms like this and others, and that is found in God's Word. 
And when we find that hope anchored in the Word of God, we can move forward with joy. As I said, there is more needed than just godly fathers. Because I can call myself that and not live for the Lord at all. And God has a perfect plan for what a man's role as a father ought to be. And that is found in the Word of God. Reject secular psychology. Retre reject that which appears over and over again on the internet and on Facebook. Blech. It's not what God plans for us. Our Bible says real fathers serve God. Real fathers are men of action. Real fathers prepare their children for adulthood. Real fathers take responsibility and real fathers are reliable. There's nothing worse for a lady than to live with a man in the home who's an absentee dad, who isn't involved with the family. What are some thoughts about being a real godly dad? Well, first of all, fathers are to love their kids. Dads, love your kids. Now, the world's view of love is an over, overwhelming feeling. It is something that overtakes you depending on what's going on around you at this time. But God's view of love, it is ever so important. God's view of love, God says that love is volitional. In other words, love is a choice. I am to love my kids and grandkids and great-grandkids because God commands it. And that honors the Lord. Our Bible says a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you all also love one another. As God loved me, or God love you, men, guys, whether you've got children or not, God commands us to love. And that kind of biblical love is not only found in the Word of God, but it is enabled by the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of a man who is yielded to Jesus Christ. One who has determined to present his body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is just our reasonable service. We are commanded to love. And love is an unselfish investment in others. There are times when being a dad or a grandpa, when you have to set aside your priorities to take time to be the daddy that God wants you to be. It's interesting. For the Christian man, our first responsibility after believing is loving. If you'll take your Bible and look at 1 John 3.3. 3. No, 1 John 3.23. 1 John 3.23. And this is his commandment. That we should believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and... Then love one another as he has given us commandment. Love is God's way of speaking to people apart from the word. 
It's you sharing the love of Christ. Father's love. And love is giving. Fathers encourage and comfort their children. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. Encourage and comfort your children. And your children may be in the 30s or maybe brand new. Comfort them. Here's what Paul wrote. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Love is giving. It's taking time. It's speaking one-on-one as well as to the family. Love is precious. And we can do that as God commands because love begins in the mind. Matthew 6 tells us, as a man thinks, so he is. As he thinks in his heart, and where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If the only time you think about your kids is when you need to discipline them, or when they fail, or when they're not what they ought to be in your eyes, that's the way you're going to treat your kids. Now, kids are a lot like parents. They will stumble. They will fall. They will make mistakes. They'll even do stupid stuff, won't we? But as we think in our heart, remembering, the Bible says those children are a gift from the Lord in Psalms. And that gift is so very precious. I wasn't even saved when Amy and Sammy uh, were born. But I remember with both of them, Amy's here, uh, going in and standing at the side of the crib. We lived in Florida. We were renting a little house. There was no air conditioning. Oh, praise the Lord. But every time I awakened and thought about Amy, I would go in and stand at the edge of the crib. And I would just be so thankful. I didn't know God. I didn't know a command. I didn't really know what love was all about. But we can, and we do. Love should be an action. Look at 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse 4. Familiar, sometimes taken out of context. But 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely does not seek his own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. And the following follow-up verse says, love never fails. You can be that godly man, really, by your actions, by your love, by your care. And if you don't have children in the home, you have children somewhere. Aunts, 
No, it wouldn't be that. Uncles, I think it'll be that. Um, neighbors, fellow church members, kids. It's amazing how little kids will look up with adoring eyes to people that are in our fellowship. They're not even your dad. We have an opportunity to have an impact. So volitionally, let's obey. First of all, our Bible says love suffers long. That means it's patient. Love is patient with our kids, dads. When they stumble, when they fall, when they're trying to learn and can't, when you're working with them and they make a mistake, be patient with your kids. Amy, Amy and I used to have fun putting things together. And we would work together, whether it be a new barbecue that we got or, I don't know, an atomic reactor. I can't remember everything. But we would work and put things together, and her little hands didn't always work well with a screwdriver. I rarely gave her a hammer in the early days, but to be patient. Love is kind. It's not inconsiderate. It's the kind of love that you speak when you're at the end of your rope and you've had it. But you choose to be kind. Because that's what God wants. Love doesn't simmer. Love is content. When Patty puts something on the stove to cook and is busy somewhere else, she always asks me to turn it down to simmer. When I do that, I find out that the, the top of the pot isn't dancing. It is not boiling. There's not anything coming out of it. It's settled. And that kind of contentment, even when you're dealing with failure, is of the Lord. Love is humble. Some dads, I'm not looking in this room now, but I've been around some dads that just think they're God's gift to dadhood. And they're so proud and they're puffed up and, they're, and they parade themselves. And boy, the kids better love me because I am dad. <sighs> Love's humble. Love's so humble that when you love your kids, admit it when you make a mistake. Ask forgiveness when you blow it. Continue on carefully, knowing you're as much a sinner as the kids are. Love is not rude or crude. Love is polite. And we have lost that element of being polite in our society. I know, as an older guy, I, when I was younger, I didn't hear some of what people, even some women, say. And I need earplugs when I stand in line at Walmart if there's other women talking. But it's as bad with dads as well. Be polite. Be generous. The word is self-giving. Not just financially. Sadly, there are some dads that say, if I, if I give my child money or if I give my child something fancy or buy him a car, then I've, I've solved all my problems. No, that's not biblical love necessarily. When I give myself, that's biblical love. Proverbs 14, 26, it'll be on the screen, it says, whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress. And for their children, it will be a refuge. Can your kids or grandkids come to you and find safety, find protection. I'm not just talking about the stranger danger that's everywhere around us, but I'm talking about the protection of society and the love of a daddy who it spills over in the mom in the way they conduct their home. Love is not irritable. 
Now, all of us get irritable. There's none of us that don't. Some of us excel in it. But that means that love is not even, love is even tempered. It's not a dad where he's high one minute and everything's great and all of a sudden, boom, he's down at the bottom and he slinks off to his man cave, shuts the door, and nobody sees him for a while. I was told there was somebody in the area that when the Georgia Bulldogs lose a game, he doesn't talk for three days in his home. Now, that may not be true. It's what I was told. Love is not irritable. Love holds no grudge. Love is, since, uh, love is forgiving. If the child does something wrong, discipline them biblically, timely, and properly. Lead them to a point of forgiveness and then move on. Try to forget it. Try to stuff it under the rug. Try to make excuses as some wives can do for their husbands. Oh, he's tired. No, we don't make excuses at times like that. But love is sincere, sympathetic. It doesn't rejoice in failures. This kind of love doesn't make fun of our kids or grandkids when they can't do it. Love is protecting. Love suffers wrong without retaliation. Sometimes your children will talk to you and your first uh, re- the first thing you want to do is just drop them through the goalpost. But you can't do that, can you? Love is trusting. It's not suspicious. But on the other side, biblical love is not hoodwinked either. Most often I find children in homes that are very good at pulling the wool over dad's or mom's eyes. They know that if they don't go to mom, they can go to dad, or vice versa. Love's trusting. It's not hoodwinked. And don't let your kids get away with it. Love is hopeful. It's not despondent. I failed. I'm not a good dad anymore. No, love is hopeful. I can get beyond that failure if I failed. Or I can get beyond the child's failure and move on with biblical love. Lastly, love is persevering. It's steadfast in the New King James. It continues Love. We find love in biblical correction. Look at Ephesians 6, 4. Ephesians 6, 4. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. There are two parts to bringing our kids up. Now notice Paul does not address mothers, though mothers are the one that to a great degree has to bear up under the weight of the home duties. Diapers, feeding, Bathing, mess. I saw something on TV. There was a dad, and he was probably just humorous, but there was a dad, he had tongs in his hand, the gas mask on his face, and he was changing a diaper. Oh, I can relate to that. And I will give no illustrations. Paul only addresses the dads. 
because dads are responsible for what goes on in the home. A dad is answerable. We heard the other day about a couple that were co-parenting their kids. That's a mess. It's going to be a worse mess by the time the kids grow. Dads are responsible, but I don't have to do it all. But I do have to know what's going on in the home. And you fathers, what does he say in this verse? Do not provoke your kids. The Greek word paragizo is the word that is translated exasperate. You might say, don't drive your kids up a wall. Now, they may drive you up a wall and you'll meet them halfway on certain days. But don't drive your kids up a wall, even though sometimes that's the way it is. Patty and I had good friends when we lived in Florida. Their names were Wally and Barb. And Barb was a sweet mama, and Wally was not. He would tease his kids. He would exasperate his kids. He would work on his son so severely that the boy would run out of the room crying and screaming, Call with it! to his daddy. He could not take any more. Don't exasperate. If you don't have kids at home, you know kids. They're everywhere. Don't embarrass them without thinking. Don't humiliate your kids in such a way that they just don't want dad to be around. Don't use excessive or cruel punishment on your children. There are some dads, especially back in the older days, under older pastors, under older dispensations, where they thought if you don't beat them till they're blue, they've not been disciplined. And that's just not the case. Don't use excessive or cruel punishment with your kids. When daddies, or moms, but when daddies pit their kids one against each other. Oh, you do such a good job on that piano. What's the matter with you, bozo? Can't you play? You know, that kind of a thing. We've all heard it. Maybe we've said it. Fathers, do not provoke your kids to wrath, but do bring them up in two things, the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. The word nurture in the Greek is paideia. It has the idea of structured discipline or correcting them God's way. When Amy was born, sorry, I've got to use you. When Amy was born, she couldn't do anything. She couldn't roll over, she couldn't sit up, she couldn't feed herself. It wasn't for me. She'd have been in trouble. <laughs> Just kidding, Patty. <laughs> but as she began to grow, she began to acquire abilities. And she began to use her giftedness that God had given her. Oh, how I wish I had been saved when our kids were babies. Thankful we got saved when they were two and three. I'm glad of that. You see, you have to fit the nurture or the structured discipline to the age of the child. And there's some, they, some things they can't do now, but they can do later. I heard a story about a a son whose dad was just over-controlling. And he treated his high school age uh, son as if he didn't have a brain in his head. 
Bring them up in the nurture, controlled uh, discipline, depending on the age. But then, he says, bring them up in the nurture and then admonition, nuthesia. It has the idea of placing into the mind that which the child needs to know. If I'd walked into Amy's room and she was in her crib, and I says, okay, sweetie, uh, we're going to go out and learn how to use the shovel. Couldn't happen. But as she grew, she could learn and understand and do. You see, admonition is patial, pa no, patient, verbal instruction. It's a, a dad especially who is able to touch the heart and the soul of his kids by godly loving discussion. When discipline is needed and corporal punishment is probably not given as much in this stage as it should be. Um, but we've got to be balanced. Nurture and admonition of the Lord. As I said this morning in beginning, there is more needed than just being a godly father. Because sometimes that's a title, but it doesn't show itself in reality. Let's bow. God, I'm thankful for our dads and grandpas and great grandpas in this room. I'm thankful, Father, that your plan is given plainly, simply, and obeyably in the Word of God. Forgive us where we've blown it. We may need to go and ask forgiveness, but we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? As we sing, again, a song that is really a, um, a song of commitment. And obviously, as the focus has been on fathers this morning, we as dads need to consider, are we doing this each and every day? Are we committing ourselves each and every day to the Lord? But even for all of us who are believers, it is important that we earnestly pray that the Lord will use us for his honor and glory. <laughs> Christ as our Savior, that those things that we do, those things that you have 
prepared for us to do, that we would do so to honor and glorify you, that no matter what it is, whether it's our, our hands, our voice, the money that you've given us, our very will as we go about our daily lives, may it be consistently to your glory, to your honor, to your praise. I pray for each of the dads in here this morning, those who are also father figures in the lives of others. May we take up your word and wear it proudly as we speak truth, your truth, to those that you have placed in front of us. And may we be good examples as you, Heavenly Father, are our example. Help us to follow the Lord Jesus. Help us to walk in step with the Spirit. And now as we go our separate ways, celebrating um, fathers today, again, may we do so to your honor and glory. Lord, there are some fathers who, who should be here that aren't here. And because of spiritual um, issues, we pray for them in a very special way. God, that you would draw them back to yourself. Or maybe they just need to trust Christ, that you would save them, Father. And help us to be willing participants in the process of sharing the gospel with those that you place in front of us each and every day. We thank you now for our time. And again, we ask that all that is done is done for your honor and your glory. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.